We offer you deep historical information from history on YouTube channel. Subscribe. Now don't forget to turn on notifications. Three Kingdoms The Three Kingdoms from 220 to 280 CE was the tripartite division of China among the dynastic states of Chao Wei, Shu Han, and Eastern Wu. The Three Kingdoms period was preceded by the Eastern Han Dynasty and was followed by the Western Jin Dynasty. The short-lived state of Yan on the Liaodong Peninsula, which lasted from 237 to 238, is sometimes considered as a fourth kingdom. Academically, the period of the Three Kingdoms refers to the period between the establishment of Cao Wei in 220 and the conquest of the Eastern Wu by the Western Jin in 280. The earlier, unofficial part of the period, from 184 to 220, was marked by chaotic infighting between warlords in various parts of China during the downfall of the Eastern Han Dynasty. The middle part of the period, from 220 to 263, was marked by a more militarily stable arrangement between three rival states of Cao Wei, Shu Han, and Eastern Wu. The later part of the era was marked by the conquest of Shu by Wei in 263, the usurpation of Cao Wei by the Western Jin in 266, and the conquest of Eastern Wu by the Western Jin in 280. Technology advanced significantly during this period. Shu Chancellor Zhuge Liang invented the wooden ox, suggested to be an early form of the wheelbarrow, and improved on the repeating crossbow. Wei mechanical engineer Ma Jun is considered by many to be the equal of his predecessor, Zhang Hung. He invented a hydraulic-powered mechanical puppet theater designed for Emperor Ming of Wei, square pallet chain pumps for irrigation of gardens in Luoyang, and the ingenious design of the south-pointing chariot, a non-magnetic directional compass operated by differential gears. The Three Kingdoms period is one of the bloodiest in Chinese history. 184, 220. Late Eastern Han Dynasty and Rise of Warlords. Prologue, China. The Three Kingdoms period, a remarkable and turbulent era in Chinese history, was preceded by a series of critical events that set the stage for the emergence of the Wei, Shu, and Wu states. Understanding the prologue to this period provides a deep insight into one of the most fascinating and influential times in Chinese history. The Eastern Han Dynasty, established in 25 CE, marked the beginning of a prosperous era. However, this prosperity was not to last. By the late 2nd century, the Han Dynasty was in decline, weakened by corruption, ineffective leadership, and power struggles within the imperial court. The eunuchs, who had gained substantial influence in the court, were often at odds with the nobility and imperial officials, leading to political instability. Yellow Turban Rebellion China Amidst this turmoil, the Yellow Turban Rebellion erupted in 184 CE. This peasant uprising, fueled by economic hardship and social injustice, posed a significant threat to the Han Dynasty's rule. The rebellion was led by Zhang Jue and his brothers, who were followers of a Taoist sect, promising a golden age of great peace, Taiping. The revolt rapidly spread across the country, exacerbating the dynasty's weaknesses. The rebellion, which got its name from the color of the cloths that the rebels wore on their heads, marked an important point in the history of Taoism due to the rebels' association with secret Taoist societies. In response to the Yellow Turban Rebellion, local warlords and military leaders rose to prominence. Among them were notable figures such as Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian, who would later become the founding figures of the Three Kingdoms. These leaders were initially tasked with suppressing the rebellion, but their military successes granted them significant power and autonomy, setting the stage for the fragmentation of the Han Dynasty. Ten Eunuchs Xian, China The Ten Eunuchs, a group of influential court officials in the late Eastern Han Dynasty of China, played a pivotal role in the empire's history leading up to the turbulent Three Kingdoms period. Their story is one of power, intrigue, and corruption, significantly impacting the dynasty's decline. The Han Dynasty, renowned for its relative stability and prosperity, began to show signs of decay by the late 2nd century CE. At the heart of the imperial court in Luoyang, the ten eunuchs known as the Xu Changxi rose to considerable power. 
Originally, eunuchs were castrated men, often slaves, serving in the imperial palace. Their inability to produce heirs allowed them to be trusted by emperors who feared the ambitions of their courtiers and relatives. However, over time, these eunuchs amassed significant influence and wealth, often overshadowing the traditional Han bureaucracy. The Ten Eunuchs referred to a group that included influential figures like Zhang Rang, Zhao Zhong, and Chao Jie. They gained the emperor's favor, particularly under Emperor Ling, or 168-189 CE, and were known to be involved in various court intrigues and corruption. The power of the Ten Eunuchs became so pervasive that they could influence imperial appointments, military decisions, and even the succession of emperors. Their interference in state affairs and control over Emperor Ling led to widespread resentment among the Han nobility and officials. This resentment was not limited to the nobility. The common people also suffered under their rule, as the eunuch's corruption often led to heavy taxation and misuse of state resources. Their involvement in the succession crisis following Emperor Ling's death in 189 CE was a critical moment. The eunuch supported the ascension of Emperor Ling's younger son, Emperor Shao, manipulating him for their gain. This led to a power struggle with the regent, General-in-Chief, He Jin, who sought to eliminate their influence. The conflict reached its peak when the eunuchs assassinated He Jin, prompting a brutal retaliation that led to the massacre of the eunuchs and their families. The fall of the ten eunuchs marked the beginning of the end for the Han Dynasty. Their demise left a power vacuum and triggered a chain of events leading to the rise of regional warlords and the fragmentation of the empire. This period of chaos set the stage for the Three Kingdoms period, a time of legendary warfare, political intrigue, and the eventual division of China into three rival states, Dongzhou Luyang, China. Following the suppression of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, the Han Dynasty continued to weaken. The power vacuum was increasingly filled by regional warlords, each vying for control. The Han Emperor, Xi'an, was a mere figurehead, manipulated by competing factions, notably by the warlord Dong Zhuo, who seized control of the capital, Luoyang, in 189 CE. Dong Zhuo's tyrannical rule and the subsequent campaign against him further plunged the empire into chaos. Campaign against Dong Zhuo Henan, China, the coalition against Dong Zhuo, formed by various warlords including Yuan Shao, Cao Chao, and Sun Jian, marked another pivotal moment. Although it temporarily unified various factions against a common enemy, the coalition soon dissolved into infighting and power struggles. This period saw the emergence of the warlords who would later dominate the Three Kingdoms era. Battle of Xingyang, Xingyang, Henan, China. The Battle of Xingyang, a pivotal conflict during the waning years of the Eastern Han Dynasty stands as a significant chapter in the lead-up to the Three Kingdoms period in China. This battle, occurring around 190-191 CE, was marked by its strategic importance and the involvement of notable warlords, setting the stage for the eventual fragmentation of the Han Empire. Xingyang, strategically located at a critical junction near the Yellow River, was a key target for warlords vying for supremacy as the Han Dynasty's power waned. The battle was primarily fought between the forces of Cao Chao, an emerging warlord, and a central figure in the Three Kingdoms period, and his rival, Zhang Miao, who was allied with another powerful warlord, Lu Bu. The conflict began when Cao Chao launched a campaign to extend his influence in the region. Recognizing the strategic importance of Xingyang, he aimed to seize control of this vital location to solidify his position and expand his territory. However, the region was under the control of Zhang Miao, a former ally who betrayed Cao Cao by siding with Lu Bu, one of the most formidable military leaders of the time. The betrayal by Zhang Miao and the alliance with Lu Bu presented a significant challenge to Cao Cao. Lu Bu was known for his martial prowess and had a reputation as a fierce warrior. His involvement in the battle made the conquest of Xingyang a formidable task for Cao Cao. The Battle of Xingyang was characterized by intense combat and strategic maneuvering. Cao Cao, known for his tactical acumen, faced a tough situation as he had to deal with the combined forces of Zhang Miao and Lu Bu. The battle saw various shifts in momentum, 
with both sides experiencing victories and setbacks. Cao Cao's leadership and strategic planning were crucial in navigating these challenges. Despite the formidable opposition, Cao Cao's forces eventually emerged victorious. The capture of Xingyang by Cao Cao was a significant milestone in his quest to consolidate power. This victory not only enhanced his reputation as a military leader, but also allowed him to gain a strategic foothold in the region, crucial for his future campaigns. The aftermath of the Battle of Xingyang had far-reaching implications. It marked the rise of Cao Cao as a dominant power in the north and set the stage for further conflicts among the various warlords. The battle was a key event in the disintegration of central authority in the Han Dynasty, leading to the fragmentation of the empire and the eventual establishment of the Three Kingdoms. Rise of local warlord Xingyang, Henan, China Cao Cao returned to Xuanzao to see the warlords feasting every day with no intention of attacking Dong Zhuo. He reproached them. Learning from his defeat in Xingyang where he tried to attack Cheng Gao head on, Cao Cao came up with an alternative strategy and presented it to the coalition. However, the generals in Xuanzao would not agree to his plan. Cao Cao abandoned the generals in Xuanzao to gather troops in Yang province with Xiao Dun, then went to camp with the coalition commander-in-chief Yuan Shao in Hene. Soon after Cao Cao's departure, the generals in Xuanzao ran out of food and dispersed. Some even fought amongst themselves. The coalition camp in Xuanzao collapsed on itself. Battle of Yangcheng Dengfeng, Henan, China The Battle of Yangcheng, a critical conflict in the early stages of the power struggles that led to the Three Kingdoms period in China, is a significant historical event marked by strategic maneuvers and notable figures. This battle, taking place around 191-192 CE, was a key moment in the escalating tensions and military engagements during the decline of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Yangcheng, strategically located and significant for its resource-rich land, became the focal point of a clash between two emerging warlords, Cao Cao and Yuan Shu. Cao Cao, a central figure in the Three Kingdoms narrative, was on a quest to consolidate power and extend his influence across the Han territory. On the other side, Yuan Shu, a powerful and ambitious warlord, sought to establish his dominance in the region. The origins of the Battle of Yangcheng can be traced to the growing ambitions of Yuan Shu, who was aggressively expanding his territory. His actions threatened the balance of power among the regional warlords, prompting Cao Cao to take decisive action. Cao Cao, recognizing the threat posed by Yuan Shu's expansion, decided to confront him at Yangcheng to curb his influence and protect his own strategic interests. The battle itself was characterized by its intensity and the tactical skills displayed by both sides. Cao Cao, known for his strategic brilliance, faced a formidable opponent in Yuan Shu, who had a well-equipped army and resources at his disposal. The conflict saw various tactical maneuvers, with both warlords attempting to outwit each other on the battlefield. Despite the challenges, Cao Cao's forces achieved a crucial victory at Yangcheng. This success was significant for several reasons. Firstly, it solidified Cao Cao's position as a dominant military leader in the region. Secondly, it weakened Yuan Shu's power, disrupting his plans for territorial expansion and diminishing his influence among the other warlords. The aftermath of the Battle of Yangcheng had lasting impacts on the political landscape of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Cao Cao's victory was a stepping stone in his journey towards becoming one of the most powerful figures in the Three Kingdoms era. It also marked a shift in the power dynamics among the warlords, contributing to the further fragmentation of the Han Empire. Dong Zhuo assassinated Jian, China. The assassination of Dong Zhuo, a pivotal event in the late Eastern Han Dynasty, marked a turning point in the chaotic period leading up to the Three Kingdoms era in China. This event, occurring in 192 CE, not only ended the reign of one of the most tyrannical figures in Chinese history, but also set in motion a series of events that further fragmented the Han Empire. Dong Zhuo, a powerful warlord and de facto ruler, rose to prominence during the tumultuous times of the Eastern Han Dynasty. His control began after he intervened in a court coup in 189 CE, ostensibly to aid the young Emperor Shao against the Ten Eunuchs' influence. However, Dong Zhuo quickly usurped power, 
deposed Emperor Shao and placed the puppet Emperor Xian on the throne, effectively controlling the central government. Dong Zhou's rule was marked by brutal tyranny and rampant corruption. He relocated the capital from Luoyang to Chang'an, a move designed to consolidate his power but which led to the burning of Luoyang and the loss of invaluable cultural treasures. His reign was characterized by cruelty, violence, and lavish spending, which further destabilized the already weakening Han dynasty. The discontent with Dong Zhou's rule grew among the Han officials and regional warlords. A coalition of warlords, formed initially to oppose him, failed to dislodge his power, but exacerbated the fragmentation of the empire into regional factions. Within his ranks, dissatisfaction was also brewing, particularly among his subordinates who resented his authoritarian rule and the preferential treatment given to his adopted son, Lu Bu. The assassination was orchestrated by Wang Yun, a Han minister, along with Lu Bu, who had grown disillusioned with Dong Zhuo. In May 192 CE, in a carefully planned coup, Lu Bu killed Dong Zhuo in the imperial palace. This assassination was a significant moment as it removed a central figure who had dominated the political landscape of the Han Dynasty. The immediate aftermath of Dong Zhuo's death was a period of further upheaval. Without his dominating presence, the central authority of the Han Dynasty weakened even more, leading to increased warfare among the various warlords vying for power. The power vacuum created by his assassination accelerated the fragmentation of the empire, setting the stage for the emergence of the Three Kingdoms. Dong Zhuo's assassination is often depicted as a turning point in the decline of the Han Dynasty. It symbolizes the end of one of the most notorious tyrannies in Chinese history and marks the beginning of an era characterized by warlordism, where regional powers battled for control, leading to the eventual establishment of the three kingdoms of Wei, Shu, and Wu. War between Keo Kyo and Zhang Exiu Nanyang, Henan, China. The war between Kao Chiu and Zhang Xu in the late Eastern Han Dynasty is a significant chapter in the tumultuous period leading up to the Three Kingdoms era in China. This conflict, occurring in the years 197-199 CE, was marked by a series of battles, shifting alliances, and strategic maneuvers, reflecting the complexity and instability of the times. Kao Chao, a central figure in the period's narrative, was on a mission to consolidate power and expand his territory across the Han Empire. Zhang Xu, a lesser known but formidable warlord, controlled the strategic region of Wancheng, now Nanyang, Henan province. The conflict originated from Cao Chao's ambition to integrate Zhang Xu's territory into his expanding domain, an ambition that set the stage for their confrontation. The war began with Cao Chao's initial success in capturing Wancheng, this victory, however, was short-lived. The turning point came with the infamous incident at Wancheng, where Cao Cao took Zhang Xu's aunt as a concubine, igniting tensions. Feeling dishonored and threatened, Zhang Xu plotted a surprise attack against Cao Cao, leading to the Battle of Wancheng. The Battle of Wancheng was a significant setback for Cao Cao. Caught off guard, his forces suffered heavy casualties, and he narrowly escaped death. This battle showcased Zhang Xu's military prowess and established him as a notable force in the regional power struggles of the time. Following this defeat, Cao Cao regrouped and launched several campaigns to regain control over Wancheng. These campaigns were characterized by their intensity and the strategic depth both leaders employed. Cao Cao, known for his tactical acumen, faced a resilient and resourceful opponent in Zhang Xu who managed to repel Cao Cao's advances initially. The conflict between Cao Cao and Zhang Xu was not just a series of military engagements. It was also marked by political maneuvering and shifting alliances. In 1999 CE, in a surprising turn of events, Zhang Xu surrendered to Cao Cao. This surrender was strategic, as Zhang Xu realized the difficulty in sustaining prolonged resistance against Cao Cao's might. For Cao Cao, this alliance bolstered his position significantly, allowing him to focus on other rivals and continue his quest for dominance. 
the war between Chao Chao and Zhang Xiu had significant implications for the period's political landscape. Chao Chao's eventual victory and Zhang Xiu's allegiance strengthened Chao Chao's hold over a vast territory, paving the way for his future campaigns and his eventual position as one of the most powerful warlords of the Three Kingdoms period. Kao Xiao's Northern China Unification Campaigns Northern China Cao Cao's campaigns to unify Northern China, commencing around the turn of the 2nd to the 3rd century CE, stand as a monumental series of military and political maneuvers in the late Eastern Han Dynasty, pivotal in setting the stage for the Three Kingdoms period. These campaigns, characterized by strategic brilliance, ruthless efficiency, and political acumen, marked Cao Chao not only as a dominant military leader, but also as a master strategist in Chinese history. At a time when the Han Dynasty was crumbling under internal corruption, external threats, and the rise of regional warlords, Cao Tao embarked on his ambitious journey to unify Northern China. His campaigns were driven by a mix of personal ambition and a vision to restore stability and order to a fractured empire. Cao Tao's initial focus was on consolidating his power base in the North China Plain. One of his early significant campaigns was against the Yellow Turban Rebellion remnants, a peasant revolt that had significantly weakened the Han Dynasty. By defeating these rebels, Cao Chao not only quelled a major source of instability, but also demonstrated his military prowess and commitment to restoring Han authority. Following this, Cao Chao engaged in a series of battles against rival warlords who controlled various parts of northern China. His notable campaigns included the battle against Yuan Shao at Guandu in 200 CE. This battle is particularly renowned for Cao Chao's strategic ingenuity, where despite being significantly outnumbered, he managed to defeat Yuan Shao, one of the most powerful warlords of the time. The victory at Guandu was a turning point, significantly diminishing Yuan Shao's power and allowing Cao Cao to assert control over the north. After Guandu, Cao Cao continued his northern campaigns, systematically subduing other warlords and consolidating power. He extended his control over the territories of Yuan Shao's sons and other northern warlords, showcasing not only his military might, but also his skill in diplomacy and governance. He integrated these territories into his growing state, bringing a semblance of order and stability to the region. Throughout his campaigns, Cao Chao implemented several administrative reforms to strengthen his control and improve the lives of the people. He restored agricultural lands, reduced taxes, and promoted trade, which helped in gaining the support of the local populace. His policies were instrumental in revitalizing the war-torn regions and laying the foundation for economic and social recovery. Cao Chao's northern campaigns culminated in his dominance over most of northern China, setting the stage for the formation of the state of Chao Wei in the ensuing Three Kingdoms period. His achievements during these campaigns were not merely military victories, but also a testament to his vision for a unified and stable China. Battle of Guandu Henan, China. The Battle of Guandu, fought in 200 CE, is one of the most significant and decisive military engagements in the late Eastern Han Dynasty, leading up to the Three Kingdoms period in China. This epic battle, primarily between the warlords Cao Cao and Yuan Shao, is renowned for its strategic importance and is often cited as a classic example of military strategy and tactics. Yuan Shao and Cao Cao, both formidable warlords, were key figures in the power struggles that engulfed China following the decline of the Han Dynasty. Yuan Shao, who controlled the vast territories north of the Yellow River, boasted a large and well-equipped army. Cao Cao, on the other hand, held smaller territories but was a brilliant strategist and tactician. The battle was precipitated by Yuan Shao's ambition to move south and extend his control over the entire North China Plain. Guandu, located near the Yellow River in present-day Henan Province, was chosen as the battleground due to its strategic significance. Cao Cao, aware of Yuan Shao's intentions, fortified his position at Guandu to intercept Yuan's southward advance. The Battle of Guandu is particularly noted for the disparity in the strength of the opposing forces. Yuan Shao's army vastly outnumbered Cao Cao's troops, and on paper, Yuan seemed poised for a straightforward victory. However, Cao Cao's strategic ingenuity turned the tables against his adversary. 
One of the critical moments of the battle was Chao Chao's daring raid on Yuan Shao's supply base at Wu Chao. This raid, executed under the cover of night, resulted in the burning of Yuan Shao's supplies and significantly demoralized his troops. The successful raid highlighted Chao Chao's ability to use deception and surprise to his advantage, despite being outnumbered. The Battle of Guandu lasted for several months, with both sides engaging in various military maneuvers and skirmishes. However, the destruction of Yuan Shao's supplies at Wu Chao was a turning point. Following this setback, Yuan Shao's army, plagued by dwindling resources and declining morale, was unable to sustain their offensive. Cao Chao, seizing the opportunity, launched a counterattack, inflicting heavy casualties and forcing Yuan Shao to retreat. The victory at Guandu was a monumental achievement for Cao Chao. It not only solidified his control over northern China, but also significantly weakened Yuan Shao, who was once considered the most powerful warlord in China. The battle diminished Yuan Shao's influence and eventually led to the fragmentation and downfall of his territory. In the broader context of Chinese history, the Battle of Guandu is seen as a key event that paved the way for the establishment of the Three Kingdoms. Cao Cao's victory laid the foundation for his future conquests and his eventual establishment of the State of Wei, one of the three major states during the Three Kingdoms period, Battle of Liang Henan, China. The Battle of Liang, a significant military engagement in the late Eastern Han Dynasty, played a crucial role in the events leading up to the Three Kingdoms period in China. Fought around 198-199 CE, this battle was a key episode in the power struggle between two of the era's most notable warlords, Cao Cao and Liu Bei. Liu Bei, a charismatic leader with a growing base of support, sought refuge with Cao Cao after suffering defeat by the hands of Liu Bu. However, the alliance between Liu Bei and Cao Cao was tenuous, as both harbored their ambitions for power. Liu Bei, sensing an opportunity, rebelled against Cao Cao and seized control of Shu province, a strategically important territory. Cao Cao, determined to quell Liu Bei's rebellion and regain control of Shu province, launched a military campaign against him. The campaign culminated in the Battle of Liang, where Cao Cao's forces confronted Liu Bei. The battle was significant not only for its military action, but also for the strategic implications it held for both leaders. Liu Bei, known for his ability to inspire loyalty and his adeptness in guerrilla warfare, posed a considerable challenge to Cao Cao's well-organized and disciplined army. The conflict at Liang saw a series of maneuvers and skirmishes, as Liu Bei employed hit-and-run tactics to offset Cao Cao's numerical and logistical advantages. Despite his valiant efforts, Liu Bei faced a formidable opponent in Cao Cao, whose strategic acumen and military might were unmatched. Cao Cao's forces gradually gained the upper hand, applying pressure on Liu Bei's positions and cutting off his supply lines. The situation for Liu Bei became increasingly untenable, leading to his eventual retreat from Liang. The Battle of Liang was a decisive victory for Cao Cao. It not only reaffirmed his dominance over the central plains of China, but also significantly weakened Liu Bei's position. This defeat forced Liu Bei to flee further east, setting in motion a series of events that would eventually lead him to seek alliance with Sun Quan and participate in the famous Battle of Red Cliffs. The aftermath of the Battle of Liang had far-reaching consequences in the context of the Three Kingdoms period. It marked a pivotal moment in the ongoing struggle for control of China, as it significantly altered the balance of power among the various warlords. Cao Cao's victory at Liang solidified his position as the dominant force in northern China, while Liu Bei's retreat laid the groundwork for the formation of the Shu Han state in the southwest. Cao Cao unites northern China, Lingyuan, Liaoning, China. Following the completion of his ambitious Northern China unification campaign, Cao Cao emerged as the preeminent power in Northern China, a feat that significantly altered the political and military landscape in the late Eastern Han Dynasty and paved the way for the subsequent Three Kingdoms period. This period of unification, which followed the successful campaigns against various rival warlords and factions, 
stands as a testament to Cao Cao's strategic genius and political acumen. Cao Cao's journey towards unifying northern China was marked by a series of well-executed military campaigns and shrewd political maneuvers, starting with the decisive victory at the Battle of Guandu in 200 CE against Yuan Shao. Cao Cao systematically consolidated his power over the north. He defeated Yuan Shao's sons in the following years, quelled potential rebellions, and subdued other powerful warlords, including the likes of Lu Bu, Liu Bei, and Zhang Xiu. The unification of northern China under Cao Cao's rule was not solely achieved through military might. Cao Cao was also a skilled administrator who implemented several reforms to stabilize and revitalize the war-torn region. He introduced agricultural policies, such as the Tuntian system, which encouraged farming on military colonies to ensure a steady supply of food for his troops and the civilian population. He also restructured the tax system, reducing the burden on the common people, and promoted trade and commerce. With the North unified, Cao Cao controlled a vast territory and commanded a large, well-equipped army. This consolidation of power significantly increased his influence over the Han imperial court. In 216 CE, Cao Cao was bestowed the title of King of Wei, a clear indication of his authority and the esteem he held in the eyes of the Han Emperor Xi'an, albeit largely ceremonial by this point. The unification of northern China under Cao Cao had profound implications for the subsequent developments in the Han Dynasty. It created a power imbalance that prompted the other major warlords, Sun Quan in the south and Liu Bei in the west, to form alliances and strengthen their positions. This realignment of powers laid the groundwork for the division of the Han Dynasty into three rival states, Wei under Cao Cao, Shu under Liu Bei, and Wu under Sun Quan. Cao Cao's success in unifying northern China also set the stage for the battles and political intrigue that characterized the Three Kingdoms period. His actions and policies during this time had lasting impacts, influencing the course of Chinese history for years to come. Battle of Red Cliffs near Yangtze River, China The Battle of Red Cliffs fought in the winter of 208-209 CE is one of the most monumental and celebrated battles in Chinese history, marking a defining moment in the lead-up to the Three Kingdoms period. This epic battle, occurring at the end of the Han Dynasty, involved a pivotal clash between the northern warlord Cao Cao and the allied forces of southern warlords Sun Quan and Liu Bei. Cao Cao, having successfully unified northern China, sought to extend his dominance over the entire Han territory. With a massive army, reputed to number in the hundreds of thousands, Cao Cao marched south with the intent to eliminate his rivals and consolidate his power over all of China. The strategic location for this major confrontation was near the Yangtze River's cliffs, known as Red Cliffs, Chibi in Chinese. The exact location remains a subject of debate among historians, but it is generally believed to have been in the vicinity of modern-day Hubei province. Sun Quan and Liu Bei, recognizing the existential threat posed by Cao Cao's campaign, formed a strategic alliance despite previous rivalries. Sun Quan, controlling the lower Yangtze region, and Liu Bei, who had established a base in the southwest, combined their forces under the leadership of Sun Quan's brilliant strategist, Zhou Yu, and Liu Bei's military advisor, Zhuge Liang. The Battle of Red Cliffs was marked not only by its massive scale, but also by the cunning strategies employed by Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang. Cao Cao's army, although superior in numbers, faced significant challenges. His northern troops were not accustomed to the southern climate and terrain, and they struggled with diseases and low morale. The turning point of the battle came with a brilliant strategic move by the Allied forces. Utilizing fire as a weapon, they launched a fire attack on Cao Cao's fleet. This attack, aided by the southeastern wind, rapidly turned Cao Cao's ships into a blazing inferno, causing immense chaos and significant losses to his army. The fire attack was a catastrophic blow to Cao Cao's campaign. Following this defeat, he was forced to retreat north, marking the failure of his ambition to unify China under his rule. This battle effectively ended Cao Cao's southward expansion and solidified the division of China into three distinct spheres of influence. 
The aftermath of the Battle of Red Cliffs had profound implications for Chinese history. It led to the establishment of the Three Kingdoms, Wei under Cao Cao, Shu under Liu Bei, and Wu under Sun Quan. This tripartite division of China persisted for several decades, characterized by continuous warfare and political intrigue. 220-229 Formation of the Three Kingdoms Three Kingdom period begins Luyang, China. When Cao Cao died in 220 CE, his son Cao Pi forces Emperor Xian of Han to abdicate and declares himself Emperor of the Wei Dynasty. So ends the Han Dynasty. Cao Pi made Luoyang capital of his new kingdom called Cao Wei, and so began the Three Kingdoms. Xiao Cao dies, Luoyang, Henan, China. In 220, Cao Chao died in Luoyang at the age of 65, having failed to unify China under his rule, allegedly of a head disease. His will instructed that he be buried near Ximenbao's tomb in Ye without gold and jade treasures, and that his subjects on duty at the frontier were to stay in their posts and not attend the funeral, as in his own words, the country is still unstable. Cao Chao's eldest surviving son, Cao Pi, succeeded him. Within a year, Cao Pi forced Emperor Xian to abdicate and proclaimed himself the first emperor of the state of Cao Wei. Cao Chao was then posthumously titled Grand Ancestor Emperor Wu of Wei. Cao Pi becomes emperor of Cao Wei, China. The ascension of Cao Pi to the throne as the emperor of Cao Wei in 220 CE marked a significant turning point in Chinese history, heralding the official end of the Han Dynasty and the beginning of the Three Kingdoms period. This event not only represented a change in the imperial lineage, but also symbolized the culmination of years of warfare and political maneuvering that had reshaped the landscape of China. Cao Pi was the eldest son of Cao Cao, a powerful warlord who had effectively unified northern China and established a dominant position in the late Eastern Han Dynasty. Following Cao Cao's death in 220 CE, Cao Pi inherited his father's vast territories and military power. At this juncture, the Han Dynasty was a mere shadow of its former glory, with the last Han Emperor, Emperor Xian, serving as little more than a puppet under Cao Cao's control. Seizing the moment, Cao Pi forced Emperor Xian to abdicate, bringing an end to the Han Dynasty, which had ruled China for over four centuries. This abdication was a significant historical moment, as it officially marked the transition from the Han Dynasty to the era of the Three Kingdoms. Cao Pi proclaimed himself the first emperor of the state of Wei, establishing the Cao Wei Dynasty. The establishment of the Cao Wei Dynasty under Cao Pi was a bold declaration of a new era. This move was not merely a change in rulership, it was a strategic step that legitimized Cao Pi's authority and his family's rule over northern China. It also set the stage for the formal division of China into three competing states, with Liu Bei proclaiming himself the Emperor of Shu Han, and Sun Quan later becoming the Emperor of Eastern Wu. Cao Pi's reign as Emperor of Cao Wei was marked by efforts to consolidate his rule and strengthen the state's administrative and military structures. He continued many of his father's policies, including centralizing power, reforming the legal and economic systems, and promoting agriculture. However, his reign also faced challenges, including tensions with the rival kingdoms of Shu and Wu, leading to continuous military campaigns and border skirmishes. Cao Pi's assumption of the imperial title and the establishment of the Cao Wei dynasty represented a pivotal shift in the political and military dynamics of the time. It signified the formal end of the Han dynasty's centralized rule and the beginning of a period characterized by fragmentation warfare and the coexistence of three rival states, each vying for supremacy. Liu Bei becomes emperor of Shuhan Chengdu, Sichuan, China. The proclamation of Liu Bei as the emperor of Shuhan in 221 CE was a momentous event in Chinese history, marking a critical juncture in the transition from the Han dynasty to the Three Kingdoms period. This event not only signified the formal establishment of the Shuhan state, but also represented the culmination of Liu Bei's journey from a humble background to becoming a key figure in one of the most turbulent and romanticized eras in China. Liu Bei, a descendant of the Han royal family, 
had long been a significant player in the waning years of the Han Dynasty, renowned for his virtuous character and his ambition to restore the Han Dynasty. Following the collapse of the Han Dynasty and the rise of the Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei's ascension to the throne was both a strategic and symbolic move. After Cao Pi, the son of Cao Cao, forced the abdication of the last Han Emperor and declared himself the Emperor of Cao Wei, the political landscape of China was irreversibly altered. In response, and to legitimize his claim as the true successor of the Han Dynasty, Liu Bei declared himself the Emperor of Shu Han in 221 CE, establishing his rule over the southwestern parts of China, primarily present-day Sichuan and Yunnan provinces. Liu Bei's rise to emperor was underpinned by his years of struggle for power and legitimacy. He was known for his compassionate and people-centric approach, which earned him widespread support among the populace and loyalty among his subordinates. His claim to the throne was further strengthened by his lineage and his portrayal as a leader committed to reviving the Han Dynasty's ideals. As emperor of Shu Han, Liu Bei focused on consolidating his power and establishing a stable administration. He was assisted by talented advisors like Zhuge Liang, whose wisdom and strategies were crucial in the administration and military campaigns of Shu Han. Liu Bei's reign, however, was also marked by challenges, including military confrontations with the rival states of Cao Wei in the north and Eastern Wu in the east. The establishment of Shu Han by Liu Bei played a significant role in the tripartite division of China that characterized the Three Kingdoms period. Alongside Cao Wei and Eastern Wu, Shu Han was one of the three rival states that emerged from the remnants of the Han Dynasty, each with its own distinct cultural and political identity. Battle of Xiaoting Yiling, Yichang, Hubei, China. The Battle of Xiaoting, also known as the Battle of Yiling, fought in 221-222 CE, is a notable military engagement in the history of the Three Kingdoms period in China. This battle, primarily between the forces of Shu Han, led by Liu Bei, and the state of Eastern Wu, commanded by Sun Quan, holds significant importance for its strategic implications and its impact on the relationships among the three kingdoms. Following the establishment of Shu Han and the declaration of Liu Bei as its emperor, tensions between the states of Shu and Wu escalated. The root cause of this conflict was the betrayal of Sun Quan, who had earlier allied with Liu Bei against Cao Tao at the Battle of Red Cliffs. Sun Quan's subsequent capture of Jing Province, a key strategic location that Liu Bei considered his own, broke the alliance and set the stage for the Battle of Xiaoting. Liu Bei, seeking to avenge the loss of Jing Province and the death of his general and close friend Guan Yu, launched a campaign against Sun Quan's forces in Eastern Wu. The battle took place in the region of Xiaoting, present-day Yichang in Hubei province. Liu Bei's intention was not only to reclaim lost territory, but also to assert his authority and the strength of Shu Han. The battle is renowned for the tactical challenges it presented, characterized by the difficult terrain of the region, which included dense forests and steep hills. Sun Quan appointed Lu Xun as his commander, who, despite being relatively young and less experienced, proved to be an adept strategist. Lu Xun adopted a defensive strategy, avoiding direct confrontation with the larger Shu forces and instead focusing on small, frequent skirmishes. This tactic exhausted the Shu army and eroded their morale. The turning point of the battle came when Lu Xun seized a strategic opportunity to launch a surprise attack. He ordered a series of fires to be set, taking advantage of the Shu army's extended supply lines and the dense woodland. The fires caused chaos and significant casualties within the Shu ranks. The Battle of Xiaoting ended in a decisive victory for Eastern Wu and a disastrous defeat for Shu Han. Liu Bei's army was forced to retreat, and Liu Bei himself died shortly afterward, reportedly from illness and the stress of his defeat. This battle significantly weakened Shu Han and marked a decline in its power. The aftermath of the Battle of Xiaoting had far-reaching implications for the dynamics of the Three Kingdoms period. It reinforced the power of Eastern Wu and demonstrated the military and strategic capabilities of its leaders. Furthermore, it disrupted the balance of power among the Three Kingdoms, leading to a period of relative stability but continuous rivalry and tension.
Zhugliang Southern Campaign Yunnan, China. Zhugliang Southern Campaign, a series of military expeditions undertaken in the early 3rd century CE, is a significant chapter in the history of the Three Kingdoms period in China. These campaigns, led by Zhu Geliang, the prime minister and military strategist of the Shu Han state, were primarily aimed at subjugating the southern tribes and consolidating Shu Han's control over the region. Following the death of Liu Bei, the founder of Shu Han, Zhu Geliang assumed a more prominent role in the state's administration and military affairs. Recognizing the strategic importance of securing Shu Han's southern borders, Zhu Geliang embarked on a series of campaigns against the Nanman tribes, who inhabited the regions of present-day southern China and northern Vietnam. The Nanman tribes, known for their independence and resistance to external control, posed a continuous threat to the stability and security of Shu Han. Their control over the southern territories also hindered Shu Han's access to crucial resources and trade routes. Zhu Geliang's objective was to bring these tribes under Shu Han's influence, either through military conquest or diplomacy. The southern campaigns are noted for the challenging terrain and climate of the region, which included dense jungles, mountainous areas, and harsh weather conditions. These factors made military operations difficult and tested the endurance and adaptability of Zhu Geliang's forces. Zhu Geliang employed a combination of military tactics and diplomatic efforts in his campaigns. He understood the importance of winning the hearts and minds of the local people and often resorted to non-violent methods to achieve his objectives. His approach involved integrating the Nanman tribes into Shu Han's administrative framework, offering them positions of authority, and adopting policies respectful of their customs and traditions. One of the most notable figures Zhu Geliang encountered during these campaigns was Meng Huo, a leader of the Nanman. Zhu Geliang is famously said to have captured and released Meng Huo seven times, a story that has become legendary in Chinese folklore. This repeated act of clemency and respect eventually convinced Meng Huo of Zhu Geliang's benevolent intentions, leading to the peaceful submission of the Nanman tribes. The successful subjugation of the Nanman tribes significantly bolstered Shu Han's position. It secured the southern borders, provided access to new resources and manpower, and enhanced the state's prestige and influence. The southern campaigns also demonstrated Zhu Geliang's prowess as a strategist and a leader who could adapt his tactics to suit diverse and challenging environments. Zhu Geliang's Northern Expeditions Gansu, China Zhu Geliang's Northern Expeditions, undertaken between 228 and 234 CE, stand as some of the most ambitious and significant military campaigns in the Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history. These expeditions were led by Zhu Geliang, the renowned prime minister and military strategist of the state of Shu Han, with the strategic goal of challenging the dominance of the state of Wei in northern China. After successfully stabilizing the southern region through his southern campaign, Zhu Geliang turned his attention northward. His primary objective was to weaken the state of Wei, led by Cao Pi and later Cao Rui, and to restore the Han dynasty by reuniting China under Shu Han rule. Zhu Geliang's northern expeditions were driven by both strategic necessity and a sense of fulfilling the legacy of his lord, Liu Bei, the founding emperor of Shu Han. The expeditions, numbering six in total, were marked by a series of battles, sieges, and maneuvers against the forces of Wei. The geographical and logistical challenges of these campaigns were immense. Zhuge Liang had to navigate through the treacherous terrain of the Qinling Mountains and secure supply lines over long distances, while also facing a formidable and well-entrenched enemy. One of the key features of the northern expeditions was Zhuge Liang's use of ingenious tactics and innovative technology including the wooden oxen and flowing horses to transport supplies, and the use of psychological warfare to outwit the enemy. Despite these innovations, the expeditions faced significant challenges. The Wei forces, aware of Zhuge Liang's reputation as a master strategist, adopted largely defensive tactics, avoiding major confrontations and focusing on cutting off Shu Han's supply lines. The most notable battles during these expeditions included the Battle of Jieting and the Battle of Wuzheng Plains. In the Battle of Jieting, a critical defeat for Shu Han, Zhu Geliang's forces suffered due to strategic miscalculations and the loss of key positions. Conversely, 
the Battle of Wuzhang Plains was a prolonged standoff that demonstrated Zhuge Liang's strategic patience and ability to maintain morale over extended periods. Despite Zhuge Liang's brilliance and the dedication of his troops, the northern expeditions did not achieve their ultimate goal of significantly weakening Wei or reunifying China. The campaigns were constrained by logistical difficulties, the formidable defenses of Wei, and the limited resources available to Xu Han. Zhuge Liang's final campaign, the Fifth Expedition, culminated in the Battle of Wuzhang Plains, where he fell ill and passed away. His death marked the end of the northern expeditions, and was a significant blow to the morale and military aspirations of Xu Han. Stalemate and balance Sun Quan becomes Emperor of Wuezhou, Hubei, China. The ascension of Sun Quan to the throne as the Emperor of Wu in 229 CE officially established the state of Eastern Wu and solidified the tripartite division of China, alongside the states of Xu Han under Liu Bei, and later his successors, and Wei under Cao Pi. Sun Quan's rise to power was a culmination of years of political maneuvering and military campaigns that began under the leadership of his elder brother Sun Ke, and then his father Sun Jian, both of whom were instrumental in establishing the Sun family's power base in the Jiangdong region. After Sun Te's untimely death, Sun Quan took over the reins of power and continued to expand and consolidate his control over the southeastern territories of China, which included key areas along the Yangtze River and the coastal regions. The decision to declare himself emperor came after Sun Quan had firmly established his authority in the region and in the wake of the political shifts following the establishment of Cao Wei and Xu Han. By proclaiming himself emperor of Wu, Sun Quan not only asserted his independence from the other states, but also legitimized his rule over his territories, providing a strong counterpoint to the claims of Cao Pi and Liu Bei. Sun Quan's reign as Emperor of Wu was characterized by both military and administrative achievements. Militarily, he is perhaps best known for his role in the Battle of Red Cliffs in 208 CE, where, allied with Liu Bei, he successfully repelled Cao Cao's massive invasion force. This battle was a turning point in the Three Kingdoms period and played a crucial role in preventing Cao Cao from dominating all of China. Administratively, Sun Quan was known for his effective governance. He implemented reforms to improve agricultural productivity, strengthen the navy, and encourage trade and commerce, particularly maritime trade. These policies not only boosted Wu's economy, but also helped in maintaining the loyalty and support of his subjects. Sun Quan's rule also saw diplomatic efforts and alliances, most notably with the state of Xu Han, though these alliances were often marked by mutual suspicion and shifting loyalties. Despite occasional conflicts and confrontations with Wei and Xu, Wu under Sun Quan maintained a strong defensive position, safeguarding its territories from major invasions. The establishment of Wu as an independent state under Sun Quan was a key factor in the prolonged stalemate that characterized the Three Kingdoms period. It represented the fragmentation of the Han Empire into three distinct and powerful states, each with its unique strengths and weaknesses. Sima Yi's Liaodong Campaign, Liaoning, China. The Liaodong Campaign led by Sima Yi, a key military figure in the state of Cao Wei during the Three Kingdoms period, was a significant military expedition aimed at conquering the northeastern territory of Liaodong. This campaign, which took place in the early 3rd century CE, was crucial for expanding Wei's control and consolidating its power in the region, further shaping the dynamics of the Three Kingdoms era. Sima Yi, renowned for his strategic acumen and as a formidable rival to Xu Han's Zhuge Liang, turned his attention to Liaodong, a region governed by Gongsun Yuan. Gongsun Yuan, initially a vassal of Wei, had declared independence and sought to establish his authority in Liaodong posing a challenge to Wei's supremacy in the north. The Liaodong campaign was not only a response to Gongsun Yuan's defiance, but also part of a broader strategy by Sima Yi to strengthen Wei's northern borders and secure key strategic and economic resources. Liaodong was significant for its strategic location, serving as a gateway to the Korean peninsula, and its control was crucial for any power aspiring to dominate the region. Sima Yi's campaign was marked by careful planning and strategic foresight. 
Understanding the challenges posed by the rugged terrain and the need for a sustained supply line, Sima Yi meticulously prepared for the expedition. He mobilized a large force, ensuring that it was well equipped and provisioned for a prolonged campaign. One of the key aspects of the Liaodong campaign was the siege of Xiangping, the stronghold of Gongsun Yuan. The siege demonstrated Sima Yi's skill in siege warfare and his patience in military engagements. Despite the formidable defenses of Xiangping and the harsh weather conditions, Sima Yi's forces maintained a relentless assault on the city. The fall of Xiangping was a turning point in the campaign. Gongsun Yuan's defeat and subsequent execution marked the end of his ambitions in Liaodong and the successful completion of Sima Yi's military objective. The conquest of Liaodong under Sima Yi's leadership significantly bolstered Wei's position in the north, extending its control and influence over a vast and strategically important region. The successful Liaodong campaign also reinforced Sima Yi's reputation as one of the most capable military leaders of his time. His victory in the northeast was not only a military triumph, but also a testament to his strategic planning, logistical organization, and leadership skills. Goguryeo Wei War Korean Peninsula The Goguryeo Wei War fought in the early 3rd century CE was a significant conflict between the Kingdom of Goguryeo, one of the three kingdoms of Korea, and the state of Cao Wei, one of the contending powers during the Three Kingdoms period in China. This war is notable for its context within the larger power struggles of the era and its implications for the relationships between the states in Northeast Asia. The conflict originated from Cao Wei's expansionist policies and Goguryeo's strategic location and growing power in the Korean Peninsula, which posed a potential threat to Cao Wei's interests in the region. Cao Wei, under the leadership of its ambitious rulers and generals, sought to assert its dominance and extend its influence over the Korean Peninsula which included the territory controlled by Goguryeo. The Goguryeo-Wei War was marked by a series of military campaigns and battles. The most significant of these was the campaign led by the Wei general, Cao Chao's son, Cao Zhen, and later by Sima Yi, one of Wei's most prominent military strategists. These campaigns were aimed at subjugating Goguryeo and bringing it under Wei control. The terrain of the Korean Peninsula particularly the mountainous regions and the fortifications of Goguryeo, posed significant challenges to the invading Wei forces. Goguryeo, under the reign of its king Gwangato the Great, had developed strong defensive capabilities and a formidable military. The kingdom was well prepared for the conflict, having anticipated Wei's expansionist ambitions. One of the most notable aspects of the war was the siege of Goguryeo's capital Pyongyang. This siege demonstrated the tenacity and resilience of the Goguryeo defenders, as well as the logistical challenges and limitations faced by the Wei forces in sustaining a prolonged military campaign far from their base. Despite initial successes, Wei's campaigns ultimately did not succeed in conquering Goguryeo. The difficulties in maintaining supply lines, the fierce resistance by Goguryeo, and the challenging terrain all contributed to Wei's inability to secure a decisive victory. The failure of these campaigns highlighted the limits of Wei's military reach and the emerging power of Goguryeo as a regional force. The Goguryeo-Wei War had significant implications for the power dynamics in Northeast Asia. It prevented Wei from extending its influence over the Korean Peninsula and solidified Goguryeo's status as a major power in the region. The conflict also drained resources and attention from Wei which was already engaged in ongoing struggles with the other two kingdoms of Shu Han and Wu in China. Fall of Diwei Luoyang, Henan, China. The fall of Wei, marking the end of one of the three major states of the Three Kingdoms period, was a significant event in the late third century CE that reshaped the political landscape of ancient China. The decline and eventual collapse of the state of Cao Wei set the stage for the reunification of China under the Jin Dynasty bringing an end to a period marked by war, political intrigue, and the division of the Chinese Empire. Cao Wei, established by Cao Pi following his father Cao Cao's consolidation of northern China, initially emerged as the strongest of the three kingdoms. However, over time, it faced a series of internal and external challenges that gradually weakened its power and stability. 
Internally, the state of Wei experienced significant political turmoil and power struggles. The latter years of the Wei dynasty were marked by the increasing influence and control of the Sima family, particularly Sima Yi and his successors Sima Shi and Sima Zhao. These ambitious regents and generals gradually usurped power from the Chao family, leading to weakening imperial authority and internal discord. Sima Yi's successful coup against the last powerful regent of the Cao family, Cao Shuang, was a turning point in the decline of Wei. This move effectively shifted the power dynamics within the state, paving the way for the Sima family's eventual control. The Sima clan's rise to power was marked by strategic political maneuvers and elimination of rivals, consolidating their influence over the state's affairs. Externally, Wei faced continuous military pressure from its rival states, Shu Han and Wu. These conflicts drained resources and further stretched the capabilities of the Wei military, exacerbating the challenges faced by the state. The final blow to the Wei dynasty came with Sima Yan, Sima Zhao's son, forcing the last Wei emperor, Cao Huan, to abdicate the throne in 265 CE. Sima Yan then proclaimed the establishment of the Jin dynasty, declaring himself Emperor Wu. This marked not only the end of the Wei dynasty, but also the beginning of the end for the Three Kingdoms period. The fall of Wei signified the culmination of the gradual shift of power from the Cao family to the Sima clan. Under the Jin dynasty, Sima Yan eventually succeeded in unifying China, bringing an end to the decades-long period of division and warfare that had characterized the Three Kingdoms era. Decline and Fall Conquest of Shu by Wei Sichuan, China The conquest of Shu by Wei, a significant military campaign in the late Three Kingdoms period, marks a pivotal chapter in Chinese history. This event, occurring in 263 CE, led to the downfall of the Shu Han Kingdom and the consolidation of the state of Wei's power, significantly altering the balance of power in the waning years of the Three Kingdoms era. Shu Han, one of the three states of the Three Kingdoms period, was established by Liu Bei and maintained under the leadership of his successors, including Liu Shan, Liu Bei's son. By the mid-third century, Shu Han, while still maintaining its sovereignty, had weakened due to a combination of internal challenges and external pressures. These challenges included political infighting, economic difficulties, and the failure of repeated military campaigns against Wei, particularly those led by the famed Shu general and strategist Zhu Geiliang. The state of Wei, under the effective control of the Sima family, particularly Sima Zhao, saw an opportunity to capitalize on Shu's vulnerabilities. Sima Zhao, recognizing the strategic importance of eliminating Shu as a rival and unifying the northern and western parts of China, planned an extensive campaign to conquer Shu. The Wei campaign against Shu was meticulously planned and executed. One of the key figures in this conquest was the Wei General Zhonghui, who led the military campaign along with Deng Ai. The Wei forces capitalized on Shu's weakened state and internal discord, advancing through strategic routes into the heartland of Shu territory. One of the most significant moments of the campaign was Deng Ai's bold and unexpected maneuver, where he led his troops through treacherous terrain to reach Chengdu, the capital of Shu, catching the Shu forces off guard. The swiftness and surprise of this move were crucial in undermining Shu's defensive efforts. Faced with the overwhelming might of the Wei army and the rapid advance towards Chengdu, Liu Shan, the last emperor of Shu Han, ultimately surrendered to Wei. The fall of Chengdu and Liu Shan's surrender marked the end of Shu Han as an independent kingdom. The conquest of Shu by Wei had profound implications for the Three Kingdoms period. It effectively eliminated Shu Han as a player in the ongoing power struggle leaving Wei and Wu as the remaining two states. The annexation of Shu significantly bolstered Wei's position, providing them with additional resources, manpower, and territory. Sima Yan declares himself emperor of the Jin dynasty Luoyang, Henan, China. The declaration of Sima Yan as emperor of the Jin dynasty in 265 CE marked a monumental shift in the political landscape of ancient China effectively bringing an end to the Sao Wei state and setting the stage for the eventual unification of China 
which had been fragmented during the tumultuous Three Kingdoms period. Sima Yan, also known as Emperor Wu of Jin, was the grandson of Sima Yi, a key figure in the state of Wei and a renowned strategist who played a significant role in the decline of the Shu Han Kingdom. The Sima family had gradually risen to prominence within the Wei hierarchy, effectively controlling the state's administration and military, and overshadowing the ruling Cao family. The ascension of Sima Yan to the throne was the culmination of years of meticulous planning and strategic positioning by the Sima clan. Sima Zhao, Sima Yan's father, had laid much of the groundwork for this transition. He had consolidated power in his hands and had been granted the Nine Bestowments, a significant honor that put him in a position akin to that of an emperor. In 265 CE, Sima Yan forced the last emperor of Wei, Cao Huan, to abdicate the throne, thereby ending the Cao Wei dynasty, which had been established by Cao Pai following the disintegration of the Han dynasty. Sima Yan then proclaimed the establishment of the Jin dynasty and declared himself Emperor Wu. This event was not a mere change of rulers, but represented a significant shift in power and the beginning of a new era in Chinese history. The establishment of the Jin dynasty under Sima Yan had several important implications. One, end of the Three Kingdoms period. The rise of the Jin dynasty marked the beginning of the end for the Three Kingdoms period, an era characterized by military strife and political fragmentation. Two, unification of China. Sima Yan set his sights on unifying China a task that the Jin dynasty would eventually accomplish. This unification brought an end to over half a century of division and warfare among the states of Wei, Shu, and Wu. 3. Transition of Power The establishment of the Jin dynasty signified a shift in the center of power in China. The Sima family, known for their military and administrative prowess, took over the mantle of leadership from the Cao family. 4. Legacy and Challenges While Sima Yan's reign saw initial success, including the conquest of Eastern Wu, the Jin Dynasty would later face its own set of challenges, including internal strife and external pressures, which eventually led to its fragmentation. Conquest of Wu by Jin Nanjing, Jiangsu, China The conquest of Wu by Jin, culminating in 280 CE, marked the final chapter in the storied Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history. This military campaign, led by the Jin Dynasty under Emperor Wu, Sima Yan, resulted in the overthrow of the state of Eastern Wu, leading to the reunification of China under a single rule for the first time since the end of the Han Dynasty. Eastern Wu, the last standing state of the original Three Kingdoms, Wei, Shu, and Wu, had managed to maintain its independence for several decades despite the shifting political landscape. Ruled by Sun Hao at the time of the Jin invasion, Wu had seen a decline in its military and administrative efficiency, partly due to internal corruption and ineffective leadership. The Jin dynasty, established by Sima Yan, after forcing the last Wei emperor to abdicate, was intent on unifying China. Having already absorbed the territory of Shu Han following its conquest in 263 CE, Jin turned its focus to Wu, the last piece in the puzzle of reunification. The campaign against Wu was a well-planned and coordinated effort, encompassing both naval and land operations. The Jin military strategy involved multiple fronts, attacking eastern Wu from the north and west, and deploying a powerful naval force to control the Yangtze River, a vital economic and strategic artery. The Jin forces were led by capable generals, such as Du Yu, Wang Jun, and Sima Zhou, who coordinated their efforts to encircle and weaken Wu. One of the key aspects of the Jin campaign was its emphasis on minimizing unnecessary destruction and encouraging surrenders. The Jin leadership offered leniency to Wu officials and military officers who surrendered, a tactic that helped in undermining Wu's resistance and facilitated a relatively swift and bloodless conquest. The fall of Eastern Wu was precipitated by the capture of its capital, Jianye, present-day Nanjing, a significant achievement that marked the end of organized resistance. Sun Hao, realizing the futility of further resistance, surrendered to the Jin forces, officially ending the existence of the state of Wu. The conquest of Wu by Jin 
was more than just a military victory. It had profound historical significance. It marked the reunification of China after a prolonged period of division and civil strife. This reunification under the Jin Dynasty symbolized the end of the Age of the Three Kingdoms, an era that had been characterized by legendary figures, epic battles, and profound shifts in power dynamics. We offer you deep historical information from history on YouTube channel. Subscribe. Now don't forget to turn on notifications.